So, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to give this presentation, to our presentation, uh, to, to your group. And also thank you for your interest in, in hydrous modeling. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so so I so so I have uh, uh, two hours uh, to entertain you. So I, I I divided it into more or less three parts. First, I will give some brief introduction about our group and, and about Hydrus 2D. Then I will show you a very brief demonstration of Hydrus 2D and 3D and uh, some examples. I will carry out one simple application on drip irrigation. And then in the third part, I will give a presentation on various add-on modules that we have developed over the years in support of the overall Hydra software. So let me first introduce the, our group. So. Uh, I, I'm collab collaborating very closely with a group of friends on uh, developing the Hydrus model, and I list them here on this slide. So it's first of all Rien van Geruchten, then Miroslav Sheina, Diedrich Jacques, and Giuseppe Brunetti. And I have a slide about each of them to introduce them. First of all, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Jirka Simunek. I'm currently at the University of California in Riverside, but uh, I, I come from Czechoslovakia, where I got all my degrees in civil engineering and water management. And I got these degrees before I came to the United States. I lived about half of my life in uh, Czechoslovakia and half of my life in, in the United States. I work mostly on numerical modeling development of these numerical models. And uh, I'm currently the editor in chief of Journal of Hydrology. And in the past, I co edited or was associate editor of other journals, such as Vedos on General Water Resources Research, etc. Uh, my closest collaborator and former boss also is uh, Rien van Geruchten. Uh, I've worked with him about for about 12 years directly for him at the US Salinity Laboratory, uh, but we are still collaborating closely uh, until, until now. He's, I consider him a founder of Vedozone Hydrology or godfather of soil physics because he introduced most of the concepts which we are using today and he pretty much defines how we understand uh, videos on hydrology and solid transport and how we describe these processes. As you can see, he has a lot of awards. He has, um, he has a couple of medals. Uh, he has fellows of many societies. And he's the most widely cited scientist in the field of soil physics, but also of hydrology in general. And it is mostly about about his work on the soil hydraulic properties, the fungus and functions are very well known, but also his work on a mobile, immobile water, preferential flow, and development of different models. Uh, then I'm working with Miroslav Sheina. He's a director of PC Progress. So that's the software company with, with which develops the graphical user interfaces, hosts the website, distribute the, the software, etc. He's a mathematician, he's a genius mathematician, he can solve pretty much any problem, both in software and in mathematics. And finally, Dietrich Jacques is a director at the Belgium, at the, well, one unit in the Belgium Nuclear Research Center. So he works on the nuclear sites or deposition at nuclear waste. And so he's interested in biogeochemical modeling, and with him, we are developing the uh, Hydrus Freaksy models. Uh, just the background geographically, so I'm from the Central Europe, and I'm currently here right now on my vacations. And so I'm speaking to you from Prague. Uh, Rien and uh, Diedrich, they are from uh, Holland and Belgium, so that's pretty close to Czechia, also in Europe. 
And um, I'm currently working at the University of California, which is uh, one of the best, I think, public university in the world. We typically have three campuses among the top 10 universities in the world, including um, UC Berkeley, UC Los Angeles, UC San Diego, etc. Okay, so I will be talking about the hydrous models. So hydrous models uh, simulate flow and solute. You heard that yesterday. And they solve it in two, one, two, and three dimensional variably saturated soils. And these are numerical models. They are used by thousands of users around the world. We had some 50,000 people who downloaded hydrous models. And so, the, as a result, there are thousands of applications published in the literature, and you can find many of them listed on our partners' website. So these are numerical models, which means that we divide the transport domain being 1D on the left, 2D here on this side, or 3D here. So we divide it into small pieces, so-called finite elements, which may be simple lines, uh, triangles, tetrahedrals, the cubes, etc. And then we integrate the governing equations over these small pieces. So this is an example from Hydrus 1D. So you worked with that yesterday, so you are familiar with this. Uh, and then in Hydrus 2D, 3D, we can solve the same processes as in Hydrus 1D, but in practically any types of two-dimensional, three-dimensional transport domain. So we solve the processes in the subsurface. So that means in the radio zone as well as in the saturated zone, and uh, as well as in the capillary range. And, and we can have in that transport domain both of these zones, both radio zone and saturated zone. You can solve the governing equations on multiple scales, from the small laboratory scales to plot scales, field scales, and you can use some of our tools even at the larger watershed scales. And similarly on temporal scales, we can go from short experiments, which can last hours or days. We can go to months, seasons, and years, and many hundreds of years, uh, such as in predictions of uh, reactions of various systems to climate change. There is many applications. I typically divide them into three groups. So first of all, agriculture. So I think that's what you are mostly interested in. And in, in this case, we, we deal basically with the mass balance in the root zone and various hydrological processes associated with that. And we can also deal with many different chemicals uh, which can occur or exist in that system. The second large groups are industrial applications. Uh, so those are applications which deal with various uh, in industrial uh, uh, pollution, municipal pollution, industrial leaks, uh, various repositories for different types of waste, for, for radionuclide waste, for municipal waste, etc. And finally, we have environmental applications uh, where we deal with various ecological applications. The hydrous can solve the heat transport equation, carbon dioxide transport, etc. So it can deal with a lot of ecological problems. I would like to also give you some kind of a history of the hydrous models. So as you can see, we track our history all the way, way back to the work of Shlomo Neumann, who is a professor emeritus now at the University of Arizona. And you can see that this history is about 50 years long. So he developed in 1972 an ANSAT model, which was a two-dimensional model which solved numerically water flow. Uh, this model was then uh, further developed at the University of Wageningen by Tom Fogel and Rainer Fedes to include the root water uptake to, to bring it to the desktop level from, from the mainframe. And then I started working on this about 30 years ago. Uh, I added solute transport. I updated various numerical schemes, which were developed, let's say, at MIT or Princeton. 
Then we added heat transport. Then we started developing graphical user interfaces. And so the history goes on. And now we are at version three, which includes not only 2D, but also 3D, but it also includes many of these add-on modules, which deal with some specific problems. Uh, so in general, all these models can solve water flows, solute transport, heat transport. So we solve the Richards equation for variably saturated water flow. And we do allow various models of soil hydraulic properties. Yesterday, you probably heard discuss that. So Van Gerucht and Brooks and Corey, uh, Kosugi, Turner, and others. We can deal with hysteresis. We can also account for sink term, uh, which can be which accounts for the root water uptake. And this sink term can be either uncompensated or compensated. And we can account for various stresses such as osmotic, saturation stress, etc., to reduce the potential uptake to, to actual uptake. We also have tools to deal with the preferential flow, and we also have tools to deal with the both isothermal and thermal, liquid and vapor flow, and all these various interactions between these processes. In terms of solute transport, we try to write it in a relatively general way. So the software can be used for many different chemicals. And so we consider convective dispersive transport in the liquid phase, diffusive transport in the gas phase. So that gives us uh, opportunity to simulate volatile chemicals. And then we have many different linear, nonlinear, uh, equilibrium, non-equilibrium interactions. Uh, with the solid phase. So that also adds a lot of flexibility. And then we also consider various reactions. But still, that may be limited. And if we have more general problems, then we have the specialized modules, which can deal with these specialized uh, problems. We also consider heat transport. And that was included initially mainly because a lot of chemical reactions depend on temperature. Uh, but, well, over time, we, we improve these modules, and uh, so we can also account for the coupled movement of water vapor energy and so on. And finally, we have also tools to, to carry out inverse optimizations, which is a very useful tool so that the models can be collaborated against existing data and the parameters needed to run the models can be optimized by this optimization. So the models can be used to simulate single ions as well as particles, various types of particles such as colloids, viruses, bacteria, nanoparticles, etc. Uh, it can be used to simulate single ions or multiple ions. And these ions must be subject to sequential first order decay. And here I give a couple of examples, radionuclides, nitrogen, pesticides, coordinated hydrocarbons, uh, pharmaceuticals, explosives, etc. And then for more general chemical problems, we have these specialized modules, and I will be talking about them in, in the last part of today's lecture. Uh, in the mid-90s, we started developing relatively sophisticated graphical user interfaces to support these models. And so here you can see graphical user interface for Hydrus 1D, which is relatively simple. And you can see its organization and a couple of outputs. And you just dis discussed that yesterday, so I will not go into detail. Then this is the graphical user interface for 2D, which is way more sophisticated than for 1D. And it's also differently organized than for 1D, so, and you will see that today. Uh, we can deal with the different types of transport domain in the Hydrus 2D 3D codes. And we divide them into these uh, five different types of geometries. So we can have simple geometries, which are kind of quadrilateral geometries. They can be more general than that, but those are simple geometries. And then we can have 2D general. And 2D general can encompass anything you can think of in 2D, which you can describe in a plane. Uh, so there is really no limit there. Then we have, uh, sorry for that, 3D simple, 
And, and again, it's relatively simple hexahedral domain. They can be more complex than that. There can be some slopes and some variations of the surface. But in general, it's rather simple. And the domains are organized in structured meshes, finite element meshes. And then we have 3D layers. And you can see example here. And in that case, we, we develop a two-dimensional base. And then using uh, thickness vectors, we build the transport domain into the third dimension. So it's a general, relatively general, but still you cannot describe all geometries. Obviously, you cannot describe sphere, for example. Right? And finally, we have 3D general domains, which again have almost no limit on how complex these geometries can be. So here I have some examples again. So these would be 2D general domains, a couple of examples from applications we did in the past. So you can see that here, some kind of a dike, some kind of a wetland system, and so on. Then this is a 2D layered system. So I mentioned that we, we 3D. So we start with the base, which can be very general. Then we build, use these thickness vectors here. And using these thickness vectors, we build the transport domain into the third dimension. And then, yeah, this is how we discretize that. So we discretize this 2D domain. And then the same mesh is used at every, every layer. Although there is quite a lot of flexibility in terms of vertical spacing. So it's a rather, rather general. It's certainly very more general than, I don't know, mod flow, right? You mentioned mod flow. And finally, we have the 3D general domains. And in that case, there is really no limit how complex the geometry can be. And you, you defi we define the geometries using 3D surfaces, which can be planar, rotary, pipe, quads, planes, etc. And you can see here some, some example of that. And the mesh. Again, relatively general, you can refine the mesh at different locations. You can stretch it in different locations. And, so on. and again, here is an example of the 3D domain defined using these 3D surfaces. And you can see that it's quite general. So you wouldn't be able to define this using the 2D layered system. Uh, here is an exam another example with some complex drainage system. So there was an application with one of our clients. Here is a 3D <clears throat> problem with the infiltration basin here. The water infiltrates here and got travel through this uh, domain into uh, some kind of a ferro here. And this is a three-dimensional domain. You can see that the surface can be very variable. You can bring it in from some GIS model, uh, the geometry of the model, or DEM model, and so on. Uh, we have a lot of users. So maybe I will skip this, and I will leave this at the end of the presentation, the Hydra's model. So let me now show you the application of the model. Yeah? OK, how, how, how it works. So what I need to share here with this. Do you see the whole, do you see my screen now? Do you see my entire screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. You don't, okay. Okay, how do I? I want to see the whole the screen. screen is there, but uh, uh, it is blank. Okay. It's white screen, yeah, white screen. Yeah. Yeah, normally I have here like shared the whole screen and here I see like share individual applications. Oh, okay, well, I will share this one. Okay, so now you see this, right? Yeah. The Hydra Studio. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So. Interface of Hydra Studio. Okay, so let me show you how, how we work with this system, right? So yesterday you worked with Hydra's 1D. Yes. And so we always start with the project manager, right? So there's a project manager and it's similar in 1D as in 2D. Again, we have these project groups. So you can divide your projects into groups 
and um, each group is defined basically by the folder somewhere. And into these project groups, you can then place individual projects. So I will try to simulate the following problem. Okay, let me describe that problem. Okay, so now you should see my 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 word. So so <laughs> what I want to simulate is subsurface line source. So I will have subsurface dripper in the transport domain, which is about um, seventy five centimeter wide, hundred centimeter deep. There will be a dripper uh, twenty centimeter below the surface, and I will be applying drip irrigation to drip irrigation um, in, in one week, yeah? So I will have one irrigation at the beginning of the week, then another one in the midweek. I will define this transport domain, then I will discretize it in the finite element, so I will show you all that, and then I will run the simulation and show you some results, okay? So let me go back to Hydrus. Somehow I can't share all of that simultaneously, I don't know why. Okay, so now we are back in Hydrus, right? So, okay, so I create a new project and I need to give it some name. So let's call it, let's say source one, A as a first example, and I will call the problem as um, subsurface or line, source yeah and once i do that and i click next so the software will generate basically a default application and we will then start uh, modifying that default application so first thing i need to do is i need to select uh, which type of geometry I will have. So I describe you that we deal with the different 2D and 3D geometries, right? That we can have these 2D simple, 2D general, 3D simple, 3D layer, 3D general. So I will work on this as a 2D general, um, so 2D problem. And then the plane can be either horizontal, right? vertical or it can be axisymmetrical. So in this case, I will deal with that as a simple two-dimensional vertical. Now I need to tell the program how large my domain is, right? Uh, or how large this view window is so that it can accommodate my transport domain. So my transport domain is 75 centimeter wide, 100 centimeter uh, tall, and so I will define the dimensions of my domain as going from minus 25, minus 25, this is uh, x100, 100, 125, so slightly larger than, than my domain, right? And then I click next. Okay, so now I have a new pro project and I will start defining that project. So a lot of the windows now you will see are the same as in 1D. Again, we will start with the, with, with the, do you see my screen? Okay, so you will start with the main processes, right? That's the same as in 1D, except here we have slightly different organization. So we will simulate only water flow, nothing else. First, then we will add Soviet transport, etc. Then next window, as you know, is time information. You can select the units, seconds, minutes, hours, days, and years, and you can select the duration of the simulation, when the simulation starts and when it ends. If you change the units, all the input parameters will be automatically converted. So as I said, I will have a uh, one week long simulation. That means seven days. And I will want to simulate two irrigation cycles. That means I will need 
four time variable boundary conditions to describe that because I will give a flux, then I will give no flux, then I will, I will give flux again and no flux again. So four, um, four different types, four different fluxes. Okay, let me follow the instructions here so I don't mess up anything. Okay, then uh, next. Okay, then we come to output information or print information. Here you can select whether you want to have output at each time step or at regular intervals. So you can have output daily. Uh, you can decide whether you send some information to the screen. And you can also check this checkbox, press enter at the end. The, this uh, checkbox is there because if you run the simulation, we want to see whether it's uh, finished successfully. So we, the simulation runs to the end. And then the, the DOS window in which the simulation ran will remain open. And you will see like final, final results, final time, final fluxes, et cetera. And then once you see that everything is okay, you hit enter and you go back to the graphical user interface. Uh, many of our users are, however, using, uh, you know, some external tools such as global optimization tools, sensitivity analysis tools, and so on. And then they won't, don't want to have this uh, press enter at the end, and so you can disable that. A lot of these tools are done by Python, so that's something is studied supposedly uh, last time. I can specify here when I want to have output uh, displayed at what time. And so I can say at what time level I want to have output. So in this case, I will select 14 output outputs. Then I click update here. And uh, you can see it, the, this uh, times are now at equal intervals. If you want to have more outputs, at, uh, let's say during the irrigation than during redistribution, then you need to change this. So let me show that I can change that. This, the, the only rule here is that this needs to be in the increasing order. So if this is not in increasing order, the program will, will have trouble with that, right? Not three, six, seven, three, seven, two, five, four, 4.5. So you can see that I'm asking for, oh, that's it. Three, seven, two, five, four, 4.5. You can see that I'm asking for more outputs during the irrigation than during the redistribution, which is much slower problem. I hope I didn't mess up anything here. Oh, I did here. Okay, let me send this. Oh, this was supposed to be 1.5. Okay, let's see. Oh, we'll see. Okay. Cool. Okay, so that's it. Okay, then we will get this window, iteration criteria. I don't know if you discussed that yesterday. So this basically tells the program how to run the time step. So we increase or decrease the time step depending on the number of iterations the program requires to solve the Richards equation. So if the number of iteration is smaller than three, then the time step is increased by 30%. If the number of iteration is larger than seven, the time step is reduced, okay? Then since it is a nonlinear equation, it is solved iteratively. And if you have iterative process, you always need to have some kind of a limit, some constraint when to stop, uh, some kind of a precision constraint, but also in ca case the, the solution gets 
um, infinite cycle, you need to be able to stop it. So we limit the number of iteration to 10. If the number of iteration is this number is reached without finding the solution, then we reduce the time step and try again. And eventually we will find the time step when we are able to solve the Richards equation. Uh, then we need to give precision criteria and we give two, uh, one in water content and one in pressure heads. And um, we give two because uh, we want to use water content uh, because that controls the mass balance. And so we use that in the unsaturated zone. But in the saturated zone, there is no change in water content, right? Because it's fully saturated. So we need to use a different criteria. Okay, so uh, Fungi, you have probably discussed yesterday these different hydraulic models. And yes, yes. Spend time on that. Uh, then you discussed the catalog, right? And Rosetta, I assume. So I will not go into that. I will just use what I have here. And um, now this is the window where I can specify these uh, time variable boundary conditions. So as I said, I will have one uh, irrigation um, cycle between during the first day, and then I will have another one in the middle of the simulation of the week, right? And so, okay. And I will use a variable flux to specify the flux at the dripper. And so that's these two values here. Okay, and that's the input which you pretty much did yesterday, right? With 1D. Uh, so now it will start being different. Now we will get into 2D, into defining the transport domain, discretizing it, et cetera. So, uh, you, unfortunately, you can't do that because probably you don't have a license. So just follow what I'm doing here. So you will have a transport domain 75 times 100 centimeter large, and we will discretize it into finite elements, into triangles. We need to tell the program how large these triangles should be in general, right? And so I will give here a value that these triangles should be about five centimeter large, okay? So that's the beginning. And now I will start defining the transport domain. Okay, so this is uh, my transport domain. I need to move this because I need to see this. So the first thing I need to do is to define some kind of a background grid, which helps me to define all the nodes which define the transport domain. And that's done under this command, which is called grid and work plane setting. And so here I will generate the background grid, which you see on this, um, on this graph. And I can define what is the interval in that background grid in the different directions? And I will make it simply one, one centimeter because my dripper will have a radius of one centimeter. You can see I have, I can define these grids into different planes if I am in 2D or 3D. I can define that into different coordinates, Cartesian, polar, et cetera. And so there is a lot of other tools which I don't have really time today to, to cover, okay? And so I say, okay. Okay, now you see that here. I don't know if we have enough resolution. So there's a background grid which helps me define my transport domain. And now here you see the different geometrical tools which I can use to define my transport domain. So in 2D, that would be points lines, arcs, uh, circles, and splines. So for this transport domain, I will use line with connected segments. And I will start somewhere here. You can see that when I'm moving around the cursor that it shows the, the exact coordinates where, where I am at any particular time. And let's see where I start. Okay, I start here. 
So that's where the dripper is. Then I go here to the origin. Then I go 75 centimeter horizontally. That's my transport delay. I'm trying to hit it as much as well as possible. But if I don't get the correct place, it's not a problem because I can obviously always correct it. And here is the top of the domain. And here I will almost close it here. And then I click the right mouse and this is a part of my domain. And then I will zoom on this area. I want to have a dripper there, which will be defined by semicircle. So I will pick here somewhere arc via three points. I start here, go here, where is it here? And here, and now you see my semicircle. And now you see my entire domain. And I will declare this to be my transport domain. How is this done? Okay, and this is my transport domain, right? So it's 75 centimeter wide, 100 centimeter tall. And there is this little dripper from which we will irrigate water into the transport domain. It's one of the most common applications I've seen. Uh, over 100 papers in literature evaluating various drip irrigation system providers. Okay, let me then show how we will define the, the mesh. Okay, so the first thing which was we defined the transport domain. In 1D, that was easier, right? You just said 100 centimeter deep. Okay, now we need to go to the next step when we will discretize the domain into triangles. In Hydra's 1D, it was uniform. You had uniform discretization into 101 nodes by default, right? But you can modify that. In this case, I have the transport domain. And you can see that the boundaries are already discretized. And they are discretized in that five centimeter steps, which I asked for. But obviously, I need finer. Uh, finer elements around the dripper, which has a diameter of only two centimeters, right? So the five centimeter mesh would not be able to, to describe that. So for that, we have a tool which we call mesh refinement. And I will click on this mesh refinement command. I can define refinement on points, on lines, surfaces, and I can say how large it is. I think it's supposed to be 0. Uh, yeah, 0. 0.5. Okay, and now, so I define the refinement and I need to assign it to, to the nodes where I want to have that. It's gonna be these nodes defining the dripper. And you can see that now I have much finer discretization in this area than in the rest of the domain. I want to also refine the nodes here because it's pretty close to this point. And so I do insert mesh refinement. I define a new one. It's gonna be larger, two centimeters, and I put that into this node. And now I, I define the discretization of the boundaries. And by clicking at the command, generate finite element mesh, the program will generate the mesh. And you can see that. And now you can see some statistics. So I have about 1,000 nodes, about 2,000 triangles. And you can also see that I have much coarser discretization here than in this area. And that's because here I will have large fluxes, large gradients, etc. Okay, so that was the second step, right? Then the third step would be to define the, let's say, distribution of different materials. So well, I assume only homogeneous domains, so I will not worry about this right now. 
uh, let me move this. Then next step would be define initial conditions and boundary conditions. So let's go into, I guess, initial conditions. By default, and you already saw that in Hydra's 1D, initial condition is minus 100 centimeters. So that's relatively wide, right? You would not irrigate at that time. So let me make the profile a little bit drier. So I click on this command, new pressure head. I say, well, let's make it minus four meters. You can see I can have the same value everywhere. I can have linear distribution with depth, some kind of a hydrostatic equilibrium, et cetera. A lot of options again. But let's do the simple one. And um, then I do assign that to this domain. So now my initial condition is minus 400 meet centimeters. So it's drier than what we had there initially. Then, okay, I'll try to keep this under an hour. Next step would be boundary condition. So you see how the software is organized, right? So it's logically organized from geometry, the finite element mesh, the domain properties, the initial conditions, boundary conditions, and finally results. Okay, so now let's go to boundary condition. By default, we have everywhere no flow boundary. In Hydrus 1D, you had upper boundary and lower boundary. We don't have that in Hydrus 2D or 3D, right? Because now we can have boundary conditions at the top, bottom, sides, everywhere. So we don't really distinguish between upper and lower. Instead, we give you a list of boundary conditions. And you can pick from these and then assign them on different types of boundaries. And these are similar as in 1D. You have atmospheric, you have constant head, constant flux, variable head, variable flux, free drainage, etc. So in this case, I will use variable flux. That will be first boundary condition. And this one I will assign on the dripper, right? So here on the dripper. So I will pick variable boundary conditions and put it here. Okay, assign. Back. Then I will also specify boundary conditions here at the bottom. So I will have, you can specify, let's say, position a water table. You can put there free drainage if the water table is deep in the profile. And so that's what I will do here. So free drainage. Okay, here. And then I assign it here. What day is it? Yeah. I can also put atmospheric here and then specify precipitation, evaporation, transpiration, et cetera. But let's just keep it simple, right? So I'll stick with this. And I think we are done. And so let me run it, right? And you can run it by clicking on this, calculate current project, or you can go to calculations, calculate current project. Uh, the simulation is relative, 2D simulations are quite fast. You see five seconds, and I have a relatively slow com computer. And now we, we also have the results here. And we can look at these different results. So uh, if we simulate water flow, so the results are only pressure adds, water contact. Uh, if, you sim if you simulate solute transport, you would have concentrations. If you simulate carbon dioxide, you would have CO2 concentration, etc. right? So it's always very dynamic, as you could see. Also, you could see that this edit bar was very dynamic, right? For geometry, we had here geometrical objects. For mesh, we had the commands dealing with the mesh. For initial conditions, we have initial conditions, etc. And for results, we have again very different, um, different uh, edit bar. So now you can look at different time levels using this list box. Yeah. So I can go to any particular time level. 
and I would see what is the pressure at distribution. You can use, do that this way. You can also do that using this scroll window, uh, scroll bar, right? So you can scroll it here using a mouse. You can click from one to the other using this. Or you can do what really our users like, do flow animation. <laughs> and then you have an animation of that process. And so you see those two irrigation pulses, and then you see redistribution, right? And so you see this entire process, how it occurs. So it's relatively, relatively simple. Right? Okay, let me stop it. We have also a lot of additional tools. We can describe various, let's say, boundary line charts, right? If I click on the boundary line chart, then I can draw the line uh, along any boundary, uh, such as this. And uh, it will show me what happens along that boundary. I can save the definition here. I can say this is my top boundary, let's say. And then the program will remember it, and I will, can come always back to it. I can also do cross sections through the domain. So if I click on this cross section, I can then click at any two locations inside of the transport domain, such as this. And then the program will show me what happens along that cross section. Again, I can save it. So cross section. I can obviously write any types of domain here. And then what's interesting is once you have that, you can actually animate even that. Yeah? You can animate these graphs. Okay, so there's nothing happening. So now we have, you know, front reaching there, and then we have redistribution, etc. So that's another output. And we can do that for different variables, as I said. You can have pressure heads, water contents. So those are quite similar, but you can see that those sale changes here. Uh, we can use show velocity vectors. So then it's kind of fireworks, right, <laughs> reflecting these two irrigation pulses. We can also show streamlines, which are quite dynamic depending on what's happening at any particular time, et cetera. In terms of this, um, these colors, you can, you have controls over these colors, so you can double click here and then you can redefine the contours, you know, the values of the contours. You can redefine the colors uh, if you want. If you want to have different, you know, sequence of colors, you can have black and white. Yeah, if if you publish in black and white um, you know, literature, which doesn't exist anymore, I guess, and so on. So you have a control over everything here. Other types of output which you can see is oh, I, I forgot to define something. We we call something observational. Okay, let me redefine it now. That's under domain properties. So under domain properties, I can define some locations, which I will call observation nodes. And you can view these observation nodes as sensors, as if you have a sensor somewhere in the feed, such as tensiometer, TDR, etc. So at these observation nodes, you will get time sequence, time series, uh, pressure adds, water contents, etc. So if I want to define observation node, let me define, let's say, five observation nodes, kind of you know, uh, arbitrary here. OK, come on. Uh, away from, from the dripper. Yeah? OK, I hope it's not too boring, like just showing you the software. <laughs> Okay, I need to rerun re re it. Okay, and now I can show you what happens at these observation points, for example. And so you would see these two irrigation pulses, redistribution, another irrigation pulse, et cetera. And this is for these four observation nodes, which I define. Um, if I show you next, if I go next, like you get water contents, 
So again, irrigation, redistribution, irrigation, redistribution, and so on. Uh, you can look at uh, boundary fluxes. So we don't have many boundary fluxes here. We have only the variable flux one. So that's where we have irrigation, right? So we specify the flux of 60, the circumference of the semicircle is pi r. And so it's 3.15, 14 times 60 about 180, as you can see here. And you can see those two pulses between 0, 1 and 3.5. I don't know if we have anything at the bottom of boundary as a free drainage, probably not, but let's look. No, so yeah, so the moisture front didn't reach the bottom of the domain. Uh, you can show cumulative fluxes, you can show soil hydraulic properties right, in different combination of these, etc. You probably look at that yesterday in one B. And you can show also mass balances. So this is something I always look at. I'm looking at this water balance relative, uh, and I want to keep this water balance relative error less than 1%. If this value is larger than 1%, then you need to do something about your project. You need to use finer discretization, uh, tighter iteration criteria, et cetera. You want to keep the mass balance below 1%, yeah? Okay, so that's simple introduction to this. Let me show another very quick step where I will add solute transport to this simulation. Right. And then I will stop with the demonstration and I will show you some other examples. Is there a question or I hear some voices? No? Okay, so let me... No. Okay, so let me... Okay, let me uh, show you how you can add solute transport also, how you can import results of one simulation to the next simulation, which is relatively simple in Hydrus 1D. So if I open the project manager, again, I will see all these projects. And I can simply make a copy of this project. Right? So I make a copy. So I call it source 2, subsurface line source with fertigation. Right? That's fertigation, if you could nutrients into irrigation water. And so what do you need to do to add solute transport? Well, you need to go to main processes, right? You've seen that yesterday in 1D. So you go to main processes and you add solute transport. Then you have a lot of options. You have standard solute transport where we solve the standard convection dispersion equation. And then you have those various add-on modules, which I will discuss uh, in my second hour. So you can use wetland module, Ansatka module with the major iron chemistry, colloid facilitated solute transport, or geochemical module with freak C. I will keep the rest of that simulation the same as I define already. And I need to only uh, specify solute transport parameters. So I can go directly to solute transport parameters. Uh, I guess you discussed most of it yesterday. And what I want to do here, basically define the dispersivity. And in addition to the longitudinal dispersivity, which we have in 1D, we also have a transverse dispersivity, okay? Uh, what else do we need to specify here? Okay, then other parameters I think you discussed yesterday. So if you use these dual porosity models with mobile and immobile, you, you need to specify that here. The, what is the immobile water content? You can define diffusion uh, coefficients in water and in gas. If you have kinetic sorption, you can define what sorption of sites is kinetic, what sorption is instantaneous. And then you can define various uh, sorption parameters, KD, 
distribution coefficient, Freundlich exponent, Langmuir eta, Henry's coefficient for volatile chemicals, and then different first order decay coefficients and so on. Okay. Uh, what I want to do here is I want to take this irrigation pulse, one day pulse, and I want to subdivide it into two parts, and I will apply nutrients only in half of that pulse. Yeah? So I will say insert line here. And so I will modify that, that I will have fertigation only in, in the first part of that irrigation pulse. And then I can subdivide the second one as well. That would be 4.5, and this would be 4. And I can put here, let's say, different a different concentration, let's say 2, just for the fun. And the rest is OK, I think, right? And now I can rerun it. And this will be slightly slower, but not much. Because now we are running both water flow and solute transport, and solute transport also limits the time step, right? To make it uh, numerically robust. And, uh, and I, will, I would have the results. I wanted to show one more thing. I wanted to show you also how you can import the results of the previous simulation as an initial condition. Okay, so let me show you that. You can go into the edit. There is initial conditions and there is import. And once you get import, you need to select the project from which you want to import, which was source one. Uh, okay, I probably didn't go. Well, let's see what happens. Yeah. Then I can import pressure heads in this case because that simulation is included only water flow. If it included also solute transport, I would be allowed to import concentrations, heat transport, temperatures, etc. Right? And I can import any time level, right? I can import from all these print times level. I can start from the middle. But typically we start from the final time. So that would be this guy, right? And then I click OK. Reaction, I can't do it in the result, that's fine. And you see, this is my initial condition. So I imported the result of that previous simulation. And now I simply extend it, right, Way beyond that one week. I need to rerun it again. Huh? And then I can show you the results. What is the... Okay, and now if you if I run that let's say animation, so you see I started from here. This was my initial condition, and then now you can see that moisture front propagates deeper into the, the soil profile, and eventually it reaches the bottom. So now I will probably have some free drainage at the bottom as well. Right? I can look at concentrations, and let me look at concentrations. I can do animation again. And you see the fertigation pulse, redistribution, another fertigation pulse, another redistribution, etc. Right. And you can keep on adding processes to that, right? You can add brood water uptake, you can get atmospheric boundary conditions, and you can see it's very flexible programs. And you, you can play with that. Okay, um, so what else to show here? So I will stop with the demonstration. I think that was a uh, demonstration which I'm using typically in my, in my courses. Uh, we work on it almost the whole day because we are adding other processes. Obviously, it goes slower if somebody new does that rather than me directly. And I have done that 100 times, so that goes relatively quickly, right? Okay. 
I, I just open here a couple of other examples, which I want to show you. So here you see a three-dimensional example, right, where we in simulated infiltration from this, this infiltration basin. I don't know if I have results here, actually. Yeah, I do have here results. Um, Well, maybe I don't. No. no, I don't have the results here. Yeah, so that's one example. In this example, I probably have the results. So, so let's see how I can rotate this. Okay, I can rotate this and I can move it to the center. And now we would see that infiltration here probably. Yeah, there are many different ways how you can display the results. I forgot to mention that, right? So you can have this like transparent view, you can have some kind of a solid view that you see only external boundaries. Um, here is another example which I'm using in the Hydra's course. And you can display the results in this way. You can also display them. How is where is it? Yeah, you can have contours, right? And if you have contours, then you what was that? Okay, where is it? Trying with a number of intermediate contours, say five. So you can have more, much more detail. So there is a lot of things. You can also save the animation as a video file, which you can then put into your uh, your PowerPoint, for example. So other types of results, where is it? Color maps, right? And here also you can add these, um, these let's say, internal lines. Uh, you can have different types of color smoothing, etc. So th there is a lot of options. So it's really difficult to. You can display results only on the final element node, which is the actual solution, right? Everything else, else is interpolation because we are solving only in in the nodes. Yeah. Yeah, you can use these zooms and zooms with different areas. And so that's another example. Then, uh, okay, if you've seen this one already. Yeah, this is another example which we did. So like three-dimensional dike through which we simulated the transport. Let me see the mesh. Yeah. I don't know if I have any results here. Looks not much yeah. yeah, I mentioned this geometry, right? This more complex geometry. Do I do that? You can see that surface is quite variable here. So this, this was defined in a quite complex way. So we imported from a GIS program coordinates of all these nodes. And that allowed us to define the, this transport domain. This was an experiment actually. So they had the lysimeters at the bottom. So we simulated the fluxes at different locations in that system. And the fluxes were, let's see how do I turn it? Okay, how am I doing here something? Anyway. Okay, well, that's the, the end of the demonstration. 
So I, I want to go now to, to my second lecture, or if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, I will go into my second lecture on those add-on modules. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I would like to invite, there was a question uh, from uh, Karthik. Uh, Karthik, please unmute your mobile and, uh, and uh, please ask your question directly related to the uh, to simulation. Otherwise, we will move for the second session. Hi, Pankaj, thanks. Um, sure, I have several questions to, so um, I'm a senior engineer at the Department of Environmental Quality here in Arizona. So we are updating our rules to uh, the on-site systems. And one of the ways we dispose the septic tank effluent is through what we call a seepage pit, it's essentially an injection well. Um, so the the rules asks for certain things, but we don't really have a, a more scientifically defensible way to address that. So we do the pre-soaking, we soak the pit, we wait if it is less than four hours, we soak it again, and then we uh, ask the applicant to go with the, proceed with the test. But there are some rule gaps in terms of how long they can wait between the soaks and how long they can wait after the soak to actually get the um, uh, the percolation rates from, for the particular seepage pit. So I'm, I'm ass assuming we can use hydrus to answer those questions in uh, probably 3D, correct? Not the 3D general, maybe. Well, it, it depends how complex is your your geometry. So we we do have some tools like for uh, drivers. Is it? Did you say that you have dry? That you have wells from which you infiltrate, or the other way? It is essentially like a dry well, but we call them seepage pits because it's taking in the septic tank effluent. Yeah, we, we actually published quite a lot of papers recently where we were using dry wells where water from the surface was uh, you know, di diverted into the dry well, and then we simulated infiltration into the transport domain. That was meant for you know, like aquifer recharge, manage aquifer mm -hmm. recharge, but it would work the other way as well. So for that, we have in the hydro study, yeah, so if you have single well, right, that would be axisymmetrical two-dimensional problem, right? For that, you would not really need 3D model. For that, for that we have something which we called uh, uh, bound, uh, reservoir boundary condition. So we have a special boundary condition for that. I don't know if I have an example for that right here, or oh, maybe I do. But plans. In this car, emptying well, yeah. So you see, so th this is a well, right? And then I, I define somewhere on the boundary condition, let me move this. On the boundary conditions, we have specialized boundary conditions and we call them reservoir boundary condition. And then we can specify like what is the initial water level in the well and then we can simulate how that water infiltrates and how long it will take for that water to infiltrate into the transport domain. And so in this particular case, for example, right, so we had water level somewhere here. We were not adding any water, but we could. And then we ran simulation. And so you see infiltration into the transport domain. And if you look at the observation points, then you can see that was initial water level. And now at this moment, everything is infiltrated. And then we have redistribution, right? And this would work both ways. So water can flow into the well and then water level would go up. You can pump water from that well. You can inject water in that well. And so this reservoir boundary condition take care of that or the mass balance in the well. And, uh, we have other shapes of the for that. Uh, where is that? Under boundary conditions. I don't know what I want to do. No, I don't want to run it. So under we have also other shapes than this. Um, we have simple well, then we have kind of a ferro 
which can be used for infiltration basins. And then we have some general function. I don't know if I have the graphs in half. Yeah, yeah, so we have these types of reservoirs for which we do these mass balance conditions, yeah. And I know that I think uh, David Radcliffe was using it for some kind of septic systems. Yeah. 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 yeah what we are trying to answer, I think, is essentially how long the applicant can wait between those soaking periods, so pre soaks. Yeah. Well, that's. Very yeah. Easy to yes. Yeah, that will depend on many conditions, right? Like hydraulic properties, etc. So you can simulate that and see what happens, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So I would do. I would probably start with the 2D, right? It's always much faster than 3D. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kartika. Yeah, we can now move for the second session. Thank okay. You. Okay, so I need to share something else, right? Okay, so I will do this. And then I will do that, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Do you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I will now talk about these specialized modules, right? So we have uh, two types of uh, add-on modules. Uh, I, one I call standard, and that's true for both Hydrus 1D and Hydrus 2D. One I call standard, and those are modules which are fully implemented in the graphical user interface. And you can display all the results. You can enter all the inputs through the graphical user interface. And the examples are HP1, which is coupling with FreeXV on Subcam, Metlan, Ferro, Dual Param, et cetera. And then we have some which we call non-standard modules where you can still use graphical user interface, but then you need to do also something manually. You have to create, let's say, manually additional input file where you provide information for that particular problem. And then you need to also look at some of the results outside of the graphical user interface. So those are done mostly for applications where we don't have so many users. If we have five, 10 users for that particular problem, then we don't feel like we should spend too much time in have implemented it into the GUI. OK, so we have a lot of these modules, I think. There is certainly more than 10, and I will try to describe them to you briefly so we finish in 45 minutes. So this slide shows the first six ones. And what's common for all of these modules is that we use the standard water flow in hydrous, so Richards equation, different hydraulic models, etc. And then we deal somehow differently, typically with the chemistry. Right. And so let me start uh, one by one with these modules. Uh, yeah, so the, the, this is those 12 modules I will discuss. So the first one is probably the more, most complex, actually. That's when we coupled hydrous with the Freaksy model uh, to be able to do very general biogeochemical reactions and processes. So we coupled Hydrus 1D as well as 2D and 3D with Freaksy. Freaksy, for those who don't know it, is a biogeochemical model which was developed by uh, USGS and namely by David Parkhorst, Anthony Apollo. It's a very widely used geochemical model which uh, allows you to simulate reactions such as aqueous complexation, redox reactions, ion exchange, surface complexation, precipitation dissolution of minerals, kinetic reactions, biological reactions, etc. So a lot of reactions which the standard hydrous code will not do. Yeah? I have here one simple example on which I demonstrate this. And so imagine that you have initially a salt profile, which is contaminated with heavy metals, uh, such as zinc, lead, and cadmium. 
And then you flush that profile with solution of calcium chloride, so without heavy metal. So you are replacing in the exchange complex heavy metals by calcium, and, and basically you are reclaiming that process, right? But to be able to do that, you need to actually account for many different reactions. You need to account for, uh, for aqueous complexation between all these uh, components. You need to account for the cation exchange between major ions, such as sodium, aluminum, calcium, lead, zinc, cadmium, etc. So a lot of different reactions. And this program will automatically account for these and will give you then let's say breakthrough curves, which you can see here for the major ions and then the, the, the heavy metals. And so you can see in this how these heavy metals were being replaced or leached out and replaced in, in the exchange complex by calcium. So calcium starts appearing here after the heavy metals are leached out of the system. So you can see it's retarded after chloride. Okay, another example is this. This is a really complex example where we simulated the uranium transport in agricultural fields. So you have uranium in many, present in many uh, mineral fertilizers naturally. And so you can simulate what will happen with the, the uranium in that system. And in this case, we simulated 200 years of applications of mineral fertilizers and wanted to account for transient conditions in the system for changing pH and so on. And as this graph shows here, the sorption of uranium very strongly depends on pH. The uranium is practically immobile if pH is larger than six, and it's very mobile if it's lower than three. And that's because of the surface complexation reactions and cation exchange. And this is the total sorption. So you can see, and, and I'm sure you are aware of that, that many radionuclides, many heavy metals have retardation factors which change orders of magnitude as pH changes by one unit, for example, right? And so in this case, we simulated breakthrough curves at 100 centimeter depths, assuming steady state conditions or daily fluxes of precipitation evaporation, which led to changes in pH. And then it's led to a different mobility of uranium. And so by accounting for the transient conditions, we would predict very different uh, arrival time than assuming steady state flow conditions, which typically people do in their applications. We have also 2D versions of HP1. Here is an example where we were simulating uranium transport from mill tailing pile. So this was an example which I developed for, in, what is it, International Atomic Energy Agency to show them how these models can be used for such applications. There's a many a lot of examples. You can download many of them on the Hydra's website uh, where we use HP model to simulate transport of heavy metals, uh, different uh, organic contaminants such as NPA, many different um, uh, radionuclides, explosives, and the most complex simulations which we are doing recently involve, for example, property changes. So we simulate dissolution of concrete over centuries uh, in the nuclear waste repositories. And as different phases of concrete dissolve, the porosity changes, conductivity changes, fluxes changes. You can account the same way for clogging, let's say in a different system in these um, drivers, for example, et cetera. So it's a very complex model, which can give you, well, it, it's complex, but gives you, uh, can solve a lot of different problems. Okay, the other model is called ANSAT-CAM. 
that's a simple model. It also simulates geochemical reactions, but deals only with the main, main cations, so main ions. Uh, so it includes, in addition to flow, heat transport, root water uptake, solid transport, it deals also with carbon dioxide transport and major ion chemistry. And so it can be used for different applications which involve uh, salinization, for example, as salt were found during irrigation or reclamation of these or disposal of different uh, produce water during different mining operations, etc. So there's a lot of applications for this module. The chemical system is limited here, so it includes only these ions, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, sulfide, chloride. It also considers different minerals such as calcite, uh, gypsum, uh, dolomite, etc., and others. It accounts for cation exchange between major ions and all the here this, and I will show you one where we use the model to simulate uh, irrigation of lysimeters. So we had a couple of lysimeters, which were irrigated with waters of different quality, different SAR or EC. And we wanted to, to predict uh, variable water contents, concentrations of individual cations such as sodium, calcium, then uh, the overall salinity expressed as electric conductivity and SAR. And what you see in this, these graphs are measured data as well as prediction by the model, which was run without any calibration. Everything was measured. So hydraulic properties were measured, Gapon constants were measured, etc. And you can see the simulations over a period of four years. So there were three, three irrigation seasons, four winter seasons. So you can see increase of salinity during the irrigation season and so on. Yeah. So these are quite nice papers in water resources. We have also a 2D module for that which is fully supported by a um, graphical user interface of Hydra's 2D. We have also the 3D version, which we recently developed for our colleagues in Israel. Okay, wetland module. This is a specialized module, which was developed by Gunther Langergraber. Interestingly, he took our very first course in 1976 as a PhD student, and then he developed this module. So what are the wetlands, right? Wetlands are systems which are used to treat the wastewater, at least in, engin in engineering sense. And there are different types of wetlands. There are vertical flow wetlands, which I show here, where you apply water at the surface, the wastewater, and then you collect it at the bottom. And so you, you have the variably saturated conditions. So the conditions are mostly aerobic. And then you can have these horizontal flow wetlands where water flows under saturated conditions through the wetland. And in this case, the conditions can become anaerobic. And so for that, we have two different modules, which we call CW2D, constructed wetland, and then CWM1, model one. So that's a um, definition in, uh, in this wastewater literature. And they account for different processes. These account only for aerobic, anoxic processes. This accounts also for anaerobic processes. And so then in each of these modules, we have different pools of different compounds. So we have always oxygen. We have different um, organic matter with different biodegradability. So some are inert, some are easily biodegradable, some are slowly biodegradable. We have different types of bacteria, heterotrophic and autotrophic, which are involved in nitrification processes. We have different pools of nitrogen, um, ammonium nitride, nitrate, 
and so on. So that's in the CW2D model. And in CWM1 model, we have additional bacteria which are involved in anaerobic processes. And so it's more complex. So this is fully implemented in graphical user interface. I am not really an expert on that. The expert on that is Gunter Langegraber, who is the head of the department at the Boku University in Austria. And yeah, you can download quite a few examples and read uh, in many papers about the applications of this. Okay, the C-Ride module. So that's a specialized module which deals with the particle transport and particle facilitated solute transport. Uh, there is evidence that many contaminants move relatively fast in the nature, while if you measure their sorption isotherms, they, they would predict that the retardation factors for these con contaminants are relatively large and the, the, these chemicals should be immobile. And then the reason why these chemicals move fast is because they attach themselves to colloidal particles. And then these colloidal particles transfer these contaminants relatively long distances, relatively fast. And examples are heavy metals, radionuclides, uh, hormones, and other contaminants. And how this module works is described in these two slides. So first we need to simulate transport at colloids, right? So we have colloidal particles dispersed in the water, and these can be bacteria, viruses, nanoparticles, simple clay particles, etc. And then these particles attach or detach themselves to the solid phase, and they can, then they can get also strained. But otherwise, they move at the same rate as water. So they, they are not retarded. They can also sort to the air-water interface, which we consider in our models, but I don't show it here. And once you add solute into this system, so then the solute can be dissolved, can sort instantaneously, so described by the distribution coefficient, can sort kinetically, described by some first order rate uh, constant, but they can also sort to these colloids, to all of these colloids, which can be mobile or immobile. And so these colloids, which are mobile, then carry this contamination with them, right? So it's kind of hitchhiking. By these, by these colloids. And this is a relatively complex system because each of these equations is one ordinary differential equations which we need to solve simultaneously. And there are many examples. I work on this example already in 2005 where we simulated uh, transport of heavy metals carried by bacteria in the subsurface aquifers. And since bacteria are relatively large, they cannot move into the small pores, they move only in the large pores. And so their movement is actually faster than the average water velocity. And so they can provide a vehicle for very rapid transport of these contaminants. Okay, dual per module. This is the module which, which we use, which we attempt to describe the preferential flow. If you look at the subsurface systems, such as fractured rocks, uh, macroporous soils, these very sedimentation layers, then you can see that it's never homogeneous. Right? There are always some preferential flow paths, macropores, fractures, etc. And so the soil physics the community developed a series of models which are called either dual porosity models or dual permeability models. And they divide the porous system 
into two domains. One where water moves quickly in macropore structures, and one where it moves slowly in the metrics, rock metrics. And you can find different terms, metrics, fractures, micropores, macropores, interpores, in, intrapores, etc. And so, as I said, the, the our community developed a series of approaches which you can use from uniform flow models where you simply solve Richards and CGE equation. Then you can have this mobile immobile water model, which is a classical model developed already in 70s, which allows you for the faster movement of contaminants in the mobile zone, but also its storage in the immobile zone. And then you can have this dual permeability model where you have fast movement in fractures and slow movement in the salt matrix. You can also combine that with various chemical non-equilibrium models where you can have chemical sorb uh, kinetic sorption, you can account for the attachment, detachment, restraining, etc. So we combine all these models together and we give you a lot of flexibility how complex you want models you want to use to describe these systems. Obviously in nature you would use a relatively simple model, but if you go into lab and you have some well-controlled processes, then you may want to use these more complex models. And all these uh, models are in that uh, module called uh, per dual perm in 2D. In 1D, it's available in the standard module. And you may recall some of these windows. So these dual porosity, dual permeability models are, you can select them in this part of this dialog window. And then these kinetic non-equilibrium model for solute transport, you can select in this part of the solute transport window. Uh, that's the example. Okay, the fumigants. I don't know if you use fumigants in India much. Uh, they are used very widely in California. Those are chemicals which are used to sterilize the soil be before they plant uh, vegetables, uh, strawberries, etc. These fumigants turn out to be very damaging for the ozone layer, and so they are quite uh, well regulated. And so I develop a specialized module which can account for the reactions which are involved in the fade and transport of fumigants for California EPA. And what we do here, we, we can um, account for the presence or absence of surface tarp, which prevents the escape of these volatile chemicals to the atmosphere. We can account for temperature dependence of these tarps removal of tarp at specified time, et cetera, injection of the, these chemicals at different locations in the transport domain and so on. So that's a specialized module as well. And it was demonstrated in this paper. Uh, I just package remote flows. So you mentioned that you are interested in that. Okay. Um, this was developed in two steps. Uh, first, I work on that with uh, Sophia Seo and um, Aileen Potter in uh, about 2007, where we work only water flow. Sophia was a PhD student at Aileen Potter, and so she developed the water flow, and we released that module at that time. Uh, about three years ago, I had a Fulbright visitor from. Uh, India, uh, Sahila Begum, and she was working on updating this, uh, this hydrous package remote flow and also so updating and improving it, but also she included additionally solute transport. So let me tell you what this module does. So in the subsurface, you have two domains, which are very often treated separately, right? You have saturated domain with groundwater, and you have vado zone with unsaturated flow. And typically, 
in engineering, we would deal with them separately. We would have models for the radial zones, such as hydras. And then we would have models for the groundwater flows, such as mod flow, right? And we, we need to define somehow the interactions between these two domains. And so that's what we try to do in that hydras package for mod flow. So what do we do here? We take the mod flow model. Let's say it has uh, two different domains with the different, uh, different processes. And then above this mod flow part, saturated flow domain, we raise the hydrous vertical. So between the groundwater and surface. So we would have one hydrous vertical representing this part of the domain and one hydrous vertical representing this part of the domain. And in hydrous, we would then describe the precipitation, transpiration, evaporation, root water uptake, layering, et cetera, and all of that. And we would simulate flow in the radio zone. And we would calculate the recharge at the bottom. And then the recharge, oh wait, we would send the information about the recharge to the to mod flow. And then mod flow would do its own calculation and it would calculate where the groundwater level is. And it would send that information to hydrous, right? And obviously you could make it more complex. You could have the whole catchment with its own geometry, with its boundary conditions. You can divide it again into different sections or zones. And in each of these zones, then you can have uh, one hydrous vertical. So if you find similar mod flow cells, like this green part, if they are similar, then we can have simple one vertical representing this whole, whole domain. And then the system works together it exchanges the information about the recharge, groundwater position. So it's a dynamic model, uh, which, which account for these processes. And obviously the assumption here is that flow in the groundwater is mostly horizontal and flow in the radio zone is only vertical because we use only hydrous water. Uh, the recent applications which we did again with uh, uh, Sahila was an application in one aquifer in Germany where we simulated both flow and transport of pesticides. And that was published just, I don't know, not last year. I don't see there, 2020, so just recently. You can download these models on the Hydra's website. There's also some descriptions how, how to use it. Um, uh, that's it, yeah. Okay, other modules. Um, we have also developed in collaboration with Jasper Vrood, who is a professor at UC Irvine, a module which we call a dream, uh, dream tool. And this dream uh, module or tool implements many different tools for global optimization, many different algorithms, amalgam, dream genetic algorithm, et cetera. I will not go into more details. I just want to mention that. If you are interested in that, you can find the information on the Hydra's website. There is also a module which deal with the mechanical stresses. That was developed in collaboration with Professor Ning Lu, who is a professor at Colorado School of Mines. And this uh, module, which we call Slope Cube, deal with the hydrological and mechanical processes in the slopes and also can evaluate stresses and slope stability. Yeah, so it has three modules. We have hydrous for hydrological stuff. And then we have stress strain deformation model, which calculate the stresses. And finally, we also calculate the stability and stability coefficients, etc. Here I give some equations, but again, I will not go into details. I just want to mention these modules and if module, and if you are in, interested in that, you can find the information at the Hydra's website. 
Okay, now I want to mention a few modules which were developed by Giuseppe Brunetti with me. So he was a PhD student who visited me about six years ago. And since then we started working quite, quite a lot together and developed several quite advanced modules. And here I list a couple of papers which we published together and I will mention some of them in more detail. So first one was the cosmic module, which is a very interesting module. As you likely know, so the Earth is constantly bombarded by cosmic rays and uh, that hits the, the ground, then um, it gets attenuated in the ground and using cosmic ray Newton probe, you can measure the, the neutron fluxes, and from these neutron fluxes, you can estimate water content at the large scale, right? which is something very important for hydrology. A lot of our means of measuring water contents are local, right? You have TDR, you take sample, you have neutron probes, etc. It's all local, but for hydrology, we need average water content at the large scale. And so using this new cosmic ray neutron probe, we can get that. And so what we implemented into HIDRS is a module which can calculate these neutron fluxes. And you can then use these neutron fluxes to estimate average water contents. And from that, you can also estimate soil hydraulic properties on the large scale. And again, that's some kind of a holy grail. Right. We have tools how to estimate hydraulic properties on the small samples. You can measure retention curves. You can measure conductivities in the field, right? But on the larger scale. But here you can get average hydraulic properties on much larger scale, which you can then use in the larger scale models. Uh, the, the module can be downloaded from the HIDRAS website here. It's one of those non-standard. So you need to enter this input file, very simple as you see, but you need to do it manually. And then the program will calculate your neutron fluxes. And then from that, you can estimate water contents, hydraulic properties and all. Okay, Ferro, well, that's a very simple application, obviously, uh, for ferro irrigation. So what we do here, we simulate flow in a ferro using the zero inertia equation for water flow and 1D advection equation for solute transport. And then the flow in the ferro is coupled with two dimensional hydrous cross sections in which we simulate subsurface processes. And so we have we simulate this complex three-dimensional system using this pseudo three-dimensional model, which considered two-dimensional flow subsurface and one-dimensional flow at the surface. In the hydrous interface, this is a standard module. There is this one additional window where we describe basically the geometry of the ferrule. Yeah, you see coordinates and X and Z. You can describe the roughness here in different domains and uh, for the Manning coefficients. And then the program will calculate uh, flow in these in, in the ferro as well as in these different cross sections. You can switch from different cross sections. You can see the advancement of water in the ferro. And so you can optimize the ferro irrigation systems. Uh, ground source heat pump, I think I will skip that one because that's not really available. We published that, but we haven't made it available. Uh, the last module which we really developed recently is the dynamic plan update model. That's a very complex model where we simulate solute transport and water flow in this system. And we also consider the plant. 
the movement of water and solute in the plant. Because that's how many chemicals get into the food chain, right? Into the human and animal food chain through plants. Because the chemicals are uptaken from uh, subsurface water or they can be deposited on the plants. They can enter through the leaves, etc. And then in the plants, they undergo various transformations. So we develop this dynamic plant uptake module where we define, sorry, we define plant using four compartments. So we have roots, stems, fruits, and leaves. And then we have soil. So in the soil, we simulate flow and transport. Then roots will take up water and chemical from the soil. And then through the root, it will go to stems and then to fruits and leaves. And you see all these reactions we consider in that model. So again, it's quite complex model, but it has many applications. And we just yesterday learned that uh, another paper using this model was published in Journal of Arts Artists Materials. Yeah, so that's just the application. Uh, there were a lot of attempts to couple hydras with the crop grows. Uh, one was done uh, by Anna Hartmann, uh, who developed directly into hydras. We, she implemented the Jones crop growth model. Uh, there are other groups we, which coupled hydras with different crop growth models. Those were done mostly in China, Epic, Wofos, and SWAT. And I'm working with a group of people who are uh, in, who coupled or implemented Hydra's flow routine into the DSAT model. I don't know if you are familiar with the DSAT model, but it's a very widely used model in crop management. And it had very weak subsurface flow part. It considered only the tipping bucket model. And so we added an option to the DSAT model to also solve the Richards equation and um, to, to consider that in a more advanced way. And this was published recently in the paper. So that's available also. Okay, well. So that's all I want to say here. No, I want to also mention the Hydra's website. Uh, we have a lot of users. We have thousands of users, as you have heard. And so we do support them through the Hydra's website. Yes, so this is Hydra's website. We support different models, Hydra's 2D, Hydra's 1D, all these different modules and so on. We post there many tutorials for 1D as well as 2D. So if you are interested in that and you want to learn about it, you can go through these tutorials. We also have there a discussion forum where people can post questions and then anybody in that community can answer that. It is often, I, I'm checking that every day, so I, I, I'm answering that every day. So if you have some general questions, don't send me an email, go to the, uh, discussion forum. First, search the discussion forum if the answer is not there already, and then you can post the question there. Uh, we also list uh, references to applications in which Hydras has been used. So Hydras 1D has been used in uh, over 1,500 papers, peer-reviewed journal articles, so we list them here, and we list also some for Hydra Studio. We also list on the Hydra's website many projects. Very often when we publish a paper, we post all the simulations which we do on the Hydra's website so people can look at that, can analyze that, can learn from that. And so we have there also other uh, projects on many different types of applications. So again, this is something you should search if you work in a particular field. I mean, bacteria transport, there are examples there. Coupled water vapor energy, there are examples there. 
isotope trends for their example, their preferential flow, etc. So we always pose these examples, subsurface drip irrigation. We pose there both examples as well as the papers in which we publish, in which we did these examples. Uh, there is also a textbook which is called Soul Physics with Hydras, where it's basically a soul physics textbook. But then we explain all of these processes using simple Excel calculations, simple stand mode simulations for solute transport, and then hydro simulations for water flow to, to explain infiltration, uh, evaporation, transpiration, etc. And finally, recently we published an ebook. Uh, which is a tutorial ebook. So in this ebook, we have a lot of examples again, how to use Hydras 1D, how to interpret Hydras 1D results, how to enter inputs, etc. So again, that should be the source of learning if you want to learn Hydras 1D. And that's that's all I have. So let me go to the end. <laughs> the slide which says thank you very much for your attention uh, <laughs> thank you very much for <laughs> such a great session uh, you would be happy to know that uh, nowadays i am simulating three phase uh, uh, like nepal transport in peatland and uh, i was uh, very happy to match the relative permeability and s relationship of three phase in peatland and uh, the two phase by hydras are matching very very close to each other so okay i'm likely to publish the data thank you now uh, this platform over to you doc dr jha please thank you thank you professor for such an such a nice or insightful demonstration for model and then i think we have a lot of questions and we will uh, discuss all questions tomorrow as well and then if not, we cannot answer, we will send you and you, you can answer as well. So uh, I see a couple of faces who joined late and they are first timers. So uh, uh, I will explain one or two lines about Siahi, what Siahi is, and then I will invite uh, one of our guests. Uh, Siahi is a platform for young scholars in agriculture and hydrology, especially uh, working towards collaboration, networking and the publications. And we also advertise a lot of positions and the grant opportunities as well. So we are pretty new. We are looking forward to have young scholars, young faculties uh, to educate more uh, young scholars in the global south. Our target is for global south because they have less opportunities. Uh, I'll invite Dr. Swami here. Dr. Swami is a stand oh. professor from IIT, IIT Mandi. And Dr. Oh. Swami can a few lines and he can encourage our uh, young scholars, Dr. Swami. Yes. Over so he's responsible for my trip to Molana. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how are you? How are Very you? Good. Very good. It's you so just good published with you. Dr. Swami a paper in WRR, right? Yes. So great. So first of all, I would uh, like to share a small memory which uh, I have uh, with the uh, Professor Simonik, uh, just a second. Am I allowed to uh, share the memory here? Sure. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, if it's not can, embarrassing. Can I... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So uh, this is a photograph which we have from the workshop. Yeah. We organized this uh, three-day workshop here at IIT Mandi. And uh, I was a little bit skeptical in between uh, uh, in, in the starting that whether uh, Professor Simonik will visit IIT Mandi or not. But I was lucky that uh, I could lure him into the, this place. <laughs> and <laughs> we had wonderful time and we had uh, wonderful coffee sessions also. Now coming to uh, this occasion, as soon as I get to know that uh, Professor Simonik is there to uh, dis uh, deliver the lecture, I could not resist to see uh, and uh, uh, say a few words. So this Society of Young uh, Agriculture and Hydrologists, <clears throat> You are, uh, you guys are doing a really wonderful job because uh, when we start our career uh, in this hydrology and uh, this kind of uh, like line, this kind of research area, we don't have many of the guidance. So whatever we 
get uh, is uh, only available from uh, like uh, from from the experienced people and uh, we cannot like individually uh, achieve to uh, what we think of to contribute into the society we cannot do that uh, like uh, with single handed or single uh, with a, a small group of people in fact if you uh, like grow uh, in this domain if you get a chance to connect with the people like uh, professor simonik who is a like uh, legend himself i would call that it, it would not be an exaggeration we know that because uh, he has contributed a lot into this field simulating this uh, typical problem of richards equation into variably saturated media would not have been easy if there was no hydras at all okay you can see that time is still sitting in the lab we are uh, working some uh, experiment on the flux permeometer and we are confident that uh, we'll be able to simulate uh, using hydra software so uh, like this work uh, first of all should reach to the scientist researchers as well as this work should be available for the common people understanding okay right uh, we had a workshop of ndma <clears throat> in which uh, we the, the the concern of the people was to identify the uh, uh the pressure or the stresses uh, because of the pore water increasing into uh, the subsurface medium and uh, they were not able to identify that how to do that then i simply said that you can use uh, hydras and uh, its different module to identify the stresses and you can you can also identify the critical gradient so hydras model is not only limited to uh, like crop and agriculture like that it is workable in landslide also i deliver a lecture on that that how to identify the like areas where the stresses will be very high pore water stresses will be high pressure will be high and which can be potentially landslide zone so like this is limitless okay so i would really uh, appreciate your work and i would also uh, be very happy to join in hand with you in this uh, like work and uh, i hope that uh, you will achieve your targets which you have decided and uh, i again say that uh, soon i will be luring him again here in the campus which is in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and <laughs> so that's all from my side guys uh, wish you all the best thank you dr swami thank you so this is kind of blazing in disguise because of covid we had set up a team and virtual world where we can meet and we can discuss so this yeah. is a blessing in disguise and that's how we are growing now so we need people like you and uh, blessings from professor simonex so we need uh, to we need to keep people working on on the common goal that's what we are trying yeah thank you for your words uh, now i'll over to dr pankaj gupta uh, dr vivek gupta he will uh, give word of thanks to professor simonex yeah thank you dr jha so on uh, behalf of whole sai team its members and all young scholars uh, i would like to thank professor simonek for a very very wonderful session and we are very thankful professor for this amazing informative session on uh, hydras 2d 3d and so many uh, add on modules now like we know a lot of many modules the people like me who who don't do a lot of ground water thing but yeah it was a very good introduction and i think uh, it, it's it's the place where to you know begin with yeah and uh, be especially you know appreciate your time from the vacations you are you know uh, if other people who don't know professor simonek is now on vacation in europe and uh, he took the time and you know provided this time for us we really appreciate we really appreciate you it was a great pleasure uh, to have you with sahi and i am confident that uh, participants would be able to uh, convert today's learning into some solutions on the ground and i hope we would have uh, more opportunities uh, in future to learn from you thank you professor simonek thank you very much and okay. with these words uh, i would pass over to dr pankaj gupta so, uh, to explain about tomorrow's session thank you yeah uh, thank you very much vivek and uh, prakash and uh, deepak uh, uh,
Yeah, so tomorrow I have uh, some input from a uh, participant to solve their problem. So uh, I have one day uh, free license <laughs> from our PC progress. So I will try to solve their problem live uh, on this session. Uh, that's again two hour session and uh, we'll keep interactive and two way and uh, please all participants be ready with your laptops and uh, we'll connect with you. And uh, with this word, I would like to uh, close this session and uh, thank you very much everyone good yeah prakash would you like yeah, before, to before before we before we conclude uh, please log in at the nine I mean, sorry indian time 7 30 sharply and we will have uh, closing remarks with another speaker to, tomorrow as well thank you professor and we'll see okay you. have a nice week good night good night, <laughs> good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye-bye.